Well, as, as uh, you all know, after this afternoon's service, we have a baptism over at um, uh, Stephanie's. Stephanie and the Hofstetters will have us over, and there will be um, going there. There are a number of um, uh, candidates. We're going to see him buried. Hallelujah. Uh, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen? Amen. Um, normally, I conclude right around 4.30. Uh, uh, we'll probably be shooting for about that this afternoon, maybe a few minutes early. And we'll think in terms of starting over there at 5.15. That gives people ample time to gather up their things. And, you know, if you're going to uh, change into your, your swimsuit or something like that, well, uh, go right ahead. No Speedos. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, uh, and obviously, you, you, you're baptized in what you're wearing right now. That's not a problem. You don't need to change into any, anything um, other than your street clothes. Um, you're just not riding home in my car. <laughs> <laughs> Should be a good time. Um, where those who have made commitments of their lives to Jesus, uh, just a... Uh, a public statement before the body of Christ and before all the world that uh, they have placed their trust in what Jesus has done on their behalf. They acknowledge that they were dead. And now in newness of life, they live to serve their Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. And um, uh, if you don't know how to get to the Hofstetters, follow somebody who does. And uh, let me also encourage uh, as many as can, uh, uh, do a little carpooling. Uh, pair up with somebody else. Um, uh, if you've been to Hofstetter's, you know, they're down a, a, a longer drive and, um, and up, uh, you get to the house. And there's not a, a lot of room and, and parking space. And um, so uh, pair up with them, um, do a little carpooling. Good there? And uh, that will make um, getting in, getting out um, a little bit more, a little bit more practical, a little easier. Turn with me in your Bibles back over to Matthew 11, and let me assign a little memory work as uh, as you're doing so. Uh, the first verse will be Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. We talked this morning about Jesus as our Savior. Amen? Amen. That's 1 Peter 1, excuse me, Matthew 1, 21. And the second verse comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18. I think we've assigned this one somewhere in the last few years. 3, 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That's 1 Peter 3, 18. Amen? So, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 28 reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is Jesus' invitation. He calls us to come to himself, to come, to know him more, to partake of his life. Life is in the Son. We've all come to know, to recognize in practice that there's really no life outside of Jesus. We're always, even as Christians, informed Christians, familiar with this doctrinal truth, uh, we still are looking to get some life and satisfaction out of things in this world. And it's just not there, is it? Nope. Not there. I mean, you, you know, you might enjoy a, a good meal, but it could be better. And the quantity could be more or less, you know, depending on you know, your, your, your temperament, right? Uh, sometimes you eat too much, sometimes you'd like to eat more, Right? Or the, you know, you, you get a nice pair of shoes or a new, new article of clothing, and it might be nice, but it, um, it's not quite as nice as it could be as somebody else has got, right? And it sure won't last very long. The niceness won't last very long, will it? And those are just 
simple, simple examples. You can take that into any realm outside of Jesus. And by design, it does not satisfy. Only Jesus does. Come to know him more. Amen? He says, come unto me. Come unto me. Because he wants us to know him more. He desires to reveal himself. He sure doesn't, he sure doesn't want us to just have empty religion. Uh, and uh, you're, you're all familiar with how uh, some people try to make God uh, after their own fashioning, don't they? Uh, I can remember the first time I heard somebody use the phrase, my Jesus uh, wouldn't do this or would do that. And, uh, and I heard what they were saying, and, uh, and they were contradicting the scripture. We're not unfamiliar with that. There are plenty of people who try to make God something other than who he is, who he is and who he has revealed himself to be. So when we talk about Jesus and our need for a close and personal relationship with him, um, let us be mindful of not uh, making him personal as though, uh, as though we had the liberty to make him who we would want him to be. He reveals himself for who he is, doesn't he? And any, <clears throat> any concepts that we hold of God uh, have got to line up with what is written. If it doesn't line up, then it's, it's not uh, true to his character, is it? There are people that think that uh, they would say things like, oh, my Jesus wouldn't do that. He wouldn't uh, uh, treat somebody with a harshness or a sternness or, or bring some kind of a, a correction or disciplinary action because Jesus, he's gentle and he's meek and he's mild, right? Right? Is he gentle? Yes, he's gentle. Is he meek? Yes. Is he kind? Yes. Is he long-suffering? Yes. Is he, uh, is he going to uh, uh, meet out wrath on the children of disobedience? Hmm? Sure. Fiery indignation? Yeah. Is he a jealous God? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want to make him... We want a personal relationship with him, close, personal, intimate relationship with him. But never can we presume to make him something other than who he has revealed himself to be. Let us hold accurate concepts of who he is. Get to know him. Amen? So he talked some this morning about Jesus as our Savior. He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's come to save his people from their sins. We talked about how, yes, he saves us from sin and he saves us for everlasting life with him, doesn't he? I wanted to talk some this afternoon about him being our substitute. And here in 1 Peter chapter 3, if you're not there, you could turn there with me. 1 Peter th chapter 3. We'll talk about Jesus being our substitute. <clears throat> Um, there are a good number of people that are not with us this afternoon. There's some of our fellowship. They're off in different places. Some of them have responsibilities here, don't they? Right? I'm sure that after Wednesday night's teaching, uh, any of them that had responsibilities for Sunday would have been very careful to make sure that they had somebody to cover for them. Amen? Amen. Anything less would have been shamefully irresponsible. There you go. <clears throat> we get somebody to cover for us if we're not going to be there to, to <clears throat> do what we're supposed to be doing. Um, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ also once suffered for, this, for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Well, in our case, <clears throat> uh, we, as those that were in our sins, dead in our trespasses and, trespasses and sins, alienated from God by our wicked works, we sure weren't in any position to, to cover for ourselves. Uh, if, um, if judgment came our way because of sin, then we got what we deserved. We talked about that this morning, right? And where do you go to find somebody that will 
take the death penalty for you. I mean, that doesn't happen. In, in, in civil society, somebody's been um, charged with, a, with a, a, a capital crime, they're sentenced to death. They, go, they give their buddy a call. Hey, you know, how'd you like to cover for me? <laughs> Schedule to be executed next week. Want to fill in for me? If, um, if we have these just unimaginable great debts, you know, we, we scratch and claw around, for, try to find some, um, some way to, to get our head above the water. And there was this sin debt. A sin debt that is, that is <clears throat> upon all humanity. And who can, who can cover for us? <clears throat> the penalty is the death penalty. Jesus stood in on our behalf. That's a Jesus that we should get to know. Amen? One that loves us so much that he would step up and take the death penalty instead of seeing us damned to hell. That's a God who loves, loves us very, very much. We should never think, well, it's a, it was an easy thing for God to do because he's God. I mean, he's almighty and, 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 and while we're thankful as human beings, sin of the whole world, you know, it, it didn't really cost him much. Don't ever let your, your mind go there. He's a holy God. It is, it is just unthinkable. It's just unimaginable for us to, uh, to, to try to consider what it was like for the, the Son of God. We talked about this morning about Jesus was the image of the invisible God. The brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. That, those are passages of scripture that tell us that God, the infinite God, the all-wise God, the eternal God, took on human form. Good there? He had that power to do so, didn't he? He could become a human. I, be, I, can't, I can't make myself invisible. I can't make myself omnipresent. But God can take himself and he can put himself into a human form. He can do that. And did in the person of Jesus Christ. And he came for sin. He came to suffer on our behalf, didn't he? I'm just unimaginable that a, a being so pure and perfect, so powerful, so great and glorious, would, would, would see fit to do that for the likes of us. Why? Why? How could he, how could he love us so? And knowing that... that that so many would reject all that he did for them. He still did it, didn't he? Yep, he sure did. Took upon himself the sin of the world. Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That's us. We are the unjust <clears throat> in this equation. And Jesus, on our behalf, in our stead, was nailed to the cross. He was beaten in Pilate's judgment hall. He was just mercilessly tortured. Had the sin of the world put upon him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. We'll look at those passages in a, in a few over there in Isaiah 53. That's what Jesus has done. Because he loves us so. Cares for us. He wants us to spend eternity with him. How important is that to us? Well, none of us wants to go to hell. But do we think about Jesus, the one to whom we are so precious? We, say, we sing the songs, Lord, you are so precious to, to me. Well, uh, frankly, uh, his love for us is greater than our love for him. He's our substitute. First, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Made to be sin. Made to be sin. The sin of the world put upon Jesus. Made to be sin. Again, we sit here today and... and uh, uh, we could try to figure out what that means. And you could read all the commentators. 
and, uh, and see what their thoughts are about what that means for the Son of God to have been made sin. And we don't know. We can't comprehend that. How God Almighty, so pure and perfect, could take our sin upon himself. You know, we, we think, wouldn't that defile him? No, it didn't defile him. He was able to, in some way, consume it. I, I, I like to think of that. <clears throat> but it cost him. Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered. Unimaginable anguish. We, we have, his, have the, the biblical account of Jesus in the garden, so, so burdened with the task that's before him that he's crying out to, to God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Sweating as it were great drops of blood, the scripture says. That, that kind of, of burden upon his soul. And on the cross he hangs there, cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the Son of God incarnate. Always doing those things which please the Father. Don't you love that passage over there in Hebrews for the joy that was set before him? The joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. You know that joy? Yeah, doing the will of the Father and purchasing for himself a bride. Yeah. Making a way that whosoever will could be welcomed, restored back into an eternal relationship with God their maker. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He's our substitute. He loves us. Do you ever try to imagine yourself there at the foot of the cross as Jesus was being crucified? Ever try to imagine what that would be like, what we would, who you would see and <clears throat> how that would affect you? One, so pure, so perfect. Maybe you're somebody that had been, maybe you're a Lazarus raised from the dead. Maybe you're somebody that, maybe you're that, that, that woman who had been uh, crippled and bowed with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Jesus loosed her of that and healed her. And now one so, so good and so kind and so compassionate is being just so brutally tortured right before your very eyes. What, did, what would you think of? Who would that man be to you? Now, he's the risen Savior. He's the Lamb of God who's taken away the sin of the world, isn't he? He did so on our behalf. He was a substitute on our behalf, wasn't he? He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In Matthew 26, let's keep moving. There are a lot of wonderful scriptures that speak to Jesus in this capacity as our substitute. This is the Last Supper. Look with me to verse 27 and following. He took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Here he is just about to be arrested. He knows that his blood will be shed for the remission of the sins of his people. And he's describing to them <clears throat> what takes place as he, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, gives himself to be executed and to be punished with our punishment. He's, he knows this is coming, sees it coming, is, is letting them know that this is all according to the plan of God. It is through this, my blood, which is about to be shed for you, that there can be the establishment of a new covenant, a new agreement where you can be restored to right relationship with God through this blood. I'm going to give my life. I'm going to, my blood will be spilled so that your lives can be spared. 
That's Jesus. And uh, we just we just can't 2000 years later think that, oh, that was somebody we really don't know very well and happened a long, long time ago. And no, on the contrary, it can be very real and very personal to us. Amen. We can we can <clears throat> understand that it was our sin that nailed him to the cross. Not just everybody's sin, no, my sin. And not Jesus loves everybody, but no, he loves me. Make it good and personal. Because it was personal to him. Real personal to him. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In Romans chapter 4, Verse 25 tells us that he was delivered for our offenses. He was delivered for our offenses. Yeah, you got the wrong guy. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. It's the other guy that's the guilty one. You got the wrong guy. No, he was the right man. He was our man. Amen? Amen. Our substitute. Only uh, the spotless, sinless lamb of God. Uh, you can't God doesn't accept a blemished sacrifice, does he? No, no. Uh, you, you couldn't bring that, that which was already dead and offer it to God, could you? No. It had to be a, a sinless or a spotless, a, a lamb without blemish. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. Amen. Delivered for our offenses. He's the one that, yep, we're the guilty. And he is the one that is taken and tortured, have, has our sin put upon him as the punishment, delivered for our offenses. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look with me to verse 6 and following. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So who are the ungodly? Yeah, it's us, for sure. Yeah. Christ died for the ungodly. We don't like to think of ourselves as ungodly. You know, you, you read about what unregenerate man is like over there in Romans 1, right? Their throat is an open sepulcher. The poison of asps is under their tongue. The way of truth they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Ungodly people. That's us. Yep. Christ died for the ungodly. When we were yet without strength. That means we had no capacity whatsoever to rescue ourselves. There's no possibility of us doing enough good, feeling enough remorse, uh, and in some way paying off the sin debt. Nope. A dead man can't do that, can he? The, the living, spotless, sinless Lamb of God came to take away the sin of the world. He came on our behalf. Christ died for the ungodly. <clears throat> Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. And we, you know, we've all considered, we've heard the accounts, you know, that uh, the, <clears throat> you know, you got the, the guys in the foxhole, right? <clears throat> and in comes, from, in comes the grenade, and there are, you know, there are four guys there, and, and one guy sees it, and he thinks, you know, okay, I'm going to dive on that thing and I'll save my buddies. Right? And people have done that. So I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, uh, and take, absorb that blast and give my life so that my buddies might live. People do that, don't they? Yep, they've done that and do that. 
But I don't know of any accounts of guys going over to the opposite side of the line and doing that for the enemy. No, but if anything, you want to get that grenade out of your foxhole and into their foxhole. <laughs> Blow all them guys up. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. We want to kill the enemy. We want to destroy the enemy. We want to destroy us. So we want to kill them before they kill us. Jesus died for the ungodly while we were his enemies. <clears throat> God commendeth, verse 8, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Enemies of God through our wicked works. Christ died for us. He's our substitute, beloved. As you get to know him, remember that, yeah, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He hung on that cross so that we could live with him forever and ever. He bore our sins. Galatians chapter 1. I'd really encourage you to go over these verses. Take some time, review them. Think of Jesus as your Savior. Think of Jesus as one who, in your place, suffered unimaginably. He says in the salutation, verses 3 and 4, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He gave himself for our sins. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Amen? He who knew no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth, right? Nothing was wrong. He was spotless. He was pure. He was perfect. He gave himself for our sins. That's what sent him to the cross. We were condemned. We were damned. We were his enemies. We were rebels. Make sure we have a proper picture of who we are and who Jesus is. How he viewed us. He knew us as his enemies. It's not like we were, you know, wanting to, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, wanting to do good and we're pretty good, just had messed up a little bit and we're looking for a little slack. Enemies. Through our wicked works, God was not in all our thoughts. And he sends Jesus to die on our behalf. He's our substitute. He came and bore the penalty for our sins, the sins of those that are around you, the sins of, of the people that are dear to you. Jesus bore their sins as a substitute so that you wouldn't have to because you couldn't. <clears throat> In Ephesians, chapter 5. We'll give you down to verse 25. It says, husbands, love your wives. We're going to be talking about husbands and wives. You know how it goes on. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He gave his all for his church, the bride of Christ. Amen? That's us. That's us. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is, again, Jesus giving of himself... <clears throat> to restore to himself a bride, to, to, to purchase for himself a bride, and to, to purify for himself a bride. He gave himself for us. Here, in this context, you know, we talk about husbands and wives, don't we? And the apostle, in writing, gives us a, a glimpse. He gives us some insight into the depth and purity and perfection of the love of Jesus for his bride. It says husbands should use that as their example. Amen? He <clears throat> gave himself <clears throat> for us. 
Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word and present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. Galatians chapter 3. Look at me down to verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Made a curse for us. Made a curse on our behalf. Remember that as you get to know Jesus. And you get to know him in the love that you have. You get to know him in the love that he has for you. He is one that was, was accursed. Accursed of God. For us, we think of him hanging up there, just mocked and ridiculed. Just uh, the, the passage there in, in uh, John 1, it's in the world, the world made by him, the world knew him not, came into his own, his own received him not. No, they, they rejected him. And he endured all that in our stead. All that he endured, all that he suffered, was what we deserved. He, he was our substitute. <clears throat> First Peter quotes the, the, <clears throat> the Isaiah 53, and we'll go over there in just a minute, but the First Peter chapter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. He bear our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propiti propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> Go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know it's a little warm in here. You stay, stay with us though, Okay. Weather like this will put any air conditioning system to the test, won't it? It's hotter than... No, I'm not going to go there right now. Unimaginable what hell will be like. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel... Good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You'll note here in this presentation of the gospel message, and that's what he says, I preached unto the gospel. And the very first element of the gospel that the apostle mentions is that Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. You know, he talked this morning, and, and there are those that, yeah, would believe that he, he was just somebody who taught uh, the, the, the brotherhood of man and, and how men need to be kind and love one another and, and care for one another. Charity. Um, Christ died for our sins. He died for our sins. He hung on that tree with a punishment for our rebellion, our disobedience. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, planned from God from eternity past. Go with me over to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. It should be viewed by us as good news that Christ died for our sins. That's a way of escape for us, isn't it? God has made a way 
for us to be delivered. Delivered for our offenses. Raised for our justification. Amen? We'll pick it up in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He was chastened that we could be restored. Peace is, is, is to make one again, to bring back into a harmonious relationship. And the only way that that could take place is for the penalty to be paid, the price to be paid. And Jesus paid the price for us to be restored to a right relationship with our maker. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's rebellion. That's pride. That's stubbornness. That's self-righteousness. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And so the Lord just wipes us all out. Just gives us the, 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 the punishment that we deserve. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And he opened not his mouth, opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. The prophet makes it real plain, doesn't he? <clears throat> that all that Jesus endured, he endured on the behalf of those whom he loved. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Do you think about that one from time to time? What does that mean? What kind of love is that? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Hallelujah. <clears throat> He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's our substitute, bearing our iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he did so very willingly, beloved was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Just over and over again, it speaks of Jesus bearing our sin, bearing our iniquity, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace, our peace upon him. Over and over again, the prophet speaks of what Jesus did as our substitute in our stead, in our place. We deserved it. And he got it. We deserved the wrath and it was poured out upon him. We deserved to be damned and Jesus was made a curse for us. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. We were thankful for his word and the truths that cause us to hope. We're thankful that, uh, that, yeah, we're thankful for a, a body of believers like this, people who know us and love us and care for us. But again, as we were saying this morning, behind all of that is the person of Jesus Christ. The reason why there is the love and the, and, and the presence of God in our midst and in our relationships 
because of Jesus. Because of Jesus doing his work in you and in me, in your brothers, in your sisters, in your home. And he did that because he, he knew that in dying on behalf of humanity, there would be some that would take him up on the offer if they would humbly acknowledge that they deserved damnation. But he offered a way of escape. That he would bear our punishment in himself and then offer to whosoever will a pardon based upon the price that he paid. He knew that there'd be some that would receive that gift by faith. And allow him to love and teach us to love in response. Amen? Get to know that Jesus. That Jesus. Who, as a substitute for your sin and for my sin, was unimaginably tortured. Our sin was put upon him. Let's get to know that Jesus better. Let's, let's uh, uh, think of that when we think of, of talking to him and what he has for our lives. We must not be guilty of just pushing Jesus off to the side. Not, not out of the way altogether, but just off to the side and just doing his will when we feel like it or seeking his face when we are acutely aware of some need. He loves us and he's always, he's always saying to us, come unto me. He's always bidding us to, to come into his holy presence to get to know him more. He wants us to, to behold his beauty, to inquire in his temple. He has provided for us exceeding, uh, exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. There's no good thing that he'll withhold. But we're not just interested in the things, are we? No, we want to get to know our God, our maker, our savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our substitute. One more. <clears throat> John 1, verse 29. John the Baptist's testimony. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That's what he came for. As our substitute, he came to take away our sin. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads before him. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we come to you. We come because Jesus has for us, for each individual here today, Jesus died with our sin, with our transgressions, with our iniquities. It pleased you, Lord God, to put upon your Son our sin. He was made to be sin for us. A sin offering. Our sin was transferred to the Lamb of God. Unfathomable debt. Unfathomable suffering. Father, we never could we put into words uh, an adequate expression of gratitude. We are ever in debt to you. We, we marvel at the depth of your love for us. How could you so care for us that even when we were your enemies, you would send your precious and beloved son to be tortured and crucified, to be made a sin offering for us, to make a way for whosoever will. Help us, Father. 
to know you more. Help us to know Jesus Christ whom you sent. We thank you for such a great love that you have for us. Teach us to love you in return with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. We do love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have loved us and given yourself for us. And we know that the scripture refers to you as the bridegroom and we as the bride and we, we want to be ready as a, as a bride without spot or any blemish, any wrinkle at your return. Now help us to prepare ourselves. Help us to be a people who look and long for your appearing. We trust you for that grace, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. And <clears throat> we'll see you.